Evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight for the second session of our ANZ Virtual Venus Forum. I think tonight you're going to find some very interesting talks on uh, mostly thrombolysis and stenting and a little bit about uh, anticoagulation as well. We have some pretty eminent um, speakers who will, uh, I think, keep you quite entertained and educated throughout the night. But uh, firstly, I just want to thank uh, BD, Bard, for, uh, and Phillips for uh, assisting us with putting this together. This is an independent session sponsored by Bard, but run by the physicians and the content is totally de uh, derived for, for the physicians by physicians. So tonight we're going to talk, firstly, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Scott Dunkley from Royal Prince Alfred Hospital on thrombosis pathophysiology followed by acute ileo femoral DVT and treatment options by Chris, Dr. Chris Rogan, followed by the use of venous stents after and during uh, lysis by Dr. Jonathan Langton. And interestingly, stents in pregnancy uh, presented by Dr. Stephen Black from the UK. These are our speakers tonight. Our first speaker is a hematologist based in Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Sydney from my hospital and somebody who I go to quite a lot to get advice about uh, anticoagulation and thrombophilias. He's a very knowledgeable person who has a clinical um, interest in general and vascular, as well as pregnancy and malignancy in he uh, hematology. He lectures at the University of Sydney and has appointments at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Chris O'Brien Lifehouse and Canterbury Hospital. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Scott Dunkley, and I'm going to hand over the screen to Dr. Dunkley. Uh, thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks for inviting me and welcome everyone. Uh, now, I'll just struggle with the uh, screen. Um, the, um, so I probably have the, uh, the, 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 the task of letting everyone uh, get their glass of wine and uh, uh, turn up appropriately. Um, and probably the most boring talk of, of, of the ones that, that are uh, outlined uh, today, which all, all seem uh, very interesting. So this is a little bit about um, pathophysiology of, of thrombosis. Uh, we've thrown in there is a little bit about the thrombophilias uh, and some of the, the drugs just for a, a reminder. Uh, so we all... can, you please, can you please share your presentation, please? Okay. How's that going, Khalid? Can you put it up then, Khalid? I, if it's not showing, it's showing on my screen. That working now? Is that working, Colour? Yes, it's up on my screen. I hope. Okay, cool. Thanks, Steve. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I, I listen to lots of Zooms, but I'm not a very good Zoom leader. Um, so, a um, bit about the hemostasis. So, we to control bleeding, everyone knows that we have the issue, these three um, components, the skin and vessel wall integrity, uh, platelets, uh, which is very dear to uh, your heart uh, as vascular uh, doctors, and the clotting factors. Um, so the platelet anatomy looks a bit like this, and I think there's some of those hidden uh, factors there. Uh, and um, some of the important features there to point out are the uh, granules, which have uh, important feedback mechanisms for platelet activation uh, and uh, clotting factors, a physical structure to change the shape uh, and a phospholipid membrane, which is non-sticky, but comes uh, inverted uh, and can bind clotting factors when it's activated. So, when platelets are activated, these are the 
important uh, aspects that occur. So you'll have receptors, so like glycoprotein 1B and 2B3A, uh, which aren't uh, very um, uh, receptive or adhesive to their uh, respective mm -hmm. ligands. But when platelets are activated, the receptor uh, activation occurs, allowing them to bind ligands. You'll get granule release, and we'll come back to the importance of this, uh, both for activation of platelets that are near other activated platelets, as well as uh, our common uh, drug uh, sites of action. This phospholipid exposure, or really this flipping of the negatively charged phospholipid membrane so that uh, you can assemble and bind clotting factors on the surface. And this is the mechanism by which after platelets adhere to a site of injury, uh, it will attract clotting factors uh, to that site. And platelets are important in uh, thrombin generation, uh, of course. So the, the steps in uh, clotting can look like this. Uh, there's an injury to the uh, endothelial lining. You have exposure of the subendothelial uh, matrix with collagen becoming present. Uh, and this uh, allows not only platelet adhesion directly to collagen, but also via bound von Willebrand's factor. And we'll come back to the receptor mechanisms of that. And then you get recruitment and activation of platelets that are bound to that first, uh, uh, there's that monolayer of platelets bound to the site of injury. And then activation and uh, attraction of clotting factors uh, to the uh, platelet uh, plug. So the important receptors uh, and mechanisms to, uh, to know about are, are this, the uh, glycoprotein, this is meant to be GB, glycoprotein 1B complex, which via von Willebrand's factor, uh, which sticks to the collagen subendothelial matrix uh, binds the platelet as it's tearing along in this picture under a high shear force in the arterial circulation, but in general uh, to, to the site of injury. The activation, so the platelets stick to that, uh, that um, exposed subendothelial matrix. The activation of the platelet with activation of the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor and ligand binding, so that you're getting intra-platelet uh, um, uh, adhesion and uh, activation, uh, and this forms the uh, platelet plug. Another important um, mechanism, as I mentioned, is, uh, is collagen, not only because it is the principal binder of von Willebrand's factor that's circulating around and sticks to the subendothelial uh, matrix, but also because we have collagen receptors and the collagen receptors are both adhesive uh, like uh, glycoprotein 1B9 and von Willebrand factor complex, but also cause activation. And you can see here, this little schema is that their uh, binding to collagen uh, here is very important in activating the glycoprotein 2B3A uh, uh, receptor and allowing uh, platelet platelet interaction and uh, and uh, platelet uh, assembly. So just coming back to this point here, where we have adhesion of a platelet monolayer, uh, an activation of some of the platelets with a platelet plug being formed. Other platelets that are nearby are activated by uh, these pathways, ADP and thromboxane. And these uh, amplification loops are very important in that process, but also very important for us because these are the main targets of our uh, common uh, antiplatelet drugs. So thromboxane generation is driven by uh, cyclooxygenase 1. And of course, aspirin is a very powerful uh, and irreversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1. And so this takes care of a very important amplification loop to allow um, platelet uh, aggregation. The other important one was release from the dense granules of ADP when platelets are activated. Uh, and 
uh, and various uh, signaling that can occur and further platelet activation that can occur with ADP and ADP receptor uh, re release. So, of course, clopidogrel and the other P2Y inhibitors are very important drugs in stopping um, uh, P2Y uh, 12 uh, signaling and further platelet uh, activation. Hemostasis, classically, when we learnt from the textbook in medical school, uh, looked like this, um, where we remembered uh, factor 12, cascading down factor 11, uh, and activating the common pathway of hemostasis with factor 10 and thrombin generation, and the extrinsic pathway to the common pathway via tissue factor. How we're meant to remember it now is the so-called cell-based model of hemostasis. And this just brings together the important elements. So here we have a, what's called a tissue factor bearing cell, where uh, in this case, we've ripped off the endothelial cells. We have tissue factor exposed. So remember before the subendothelial matrix was binding and activating the platelets. Now we're activating clotting factors. So tissue factors exposed. Uh, it binds a little bit of circulating factor seven, which is activated. And we get trace elements of activation of factor 10, platelets releasing clotting factor factor five, and a little bit of thrombin uh, is generated at the site of injury. And this causes uh, both activation of platelets, which are bound to that site, activation of the labile clotting factors, and the classic old intrinsic pathway, so that we get formation on the platelet surface, which is activated and is now binding these uh, clotting factors of this 10A complex, which is the classic haemophilia um, uh, clotting factors, and then activation of factor uh, 10 in the so-called prothrombinase complex, and this burst of thrombin, which gets everything uh, going. So thrombin becomes the uh, be-all and end-all. The one that we know about uh, mostly, of course, is that thrombin uh, um, converts uh, fibrinogen to fibrin, uh, and the fibrin clot is stabilized by thrombin itself via factor 13. But there's a lot of uh, cellular activation, including platelets, endothelial cells, and activation of clotting factors. So the thrombin burst is the really powerful uh, element in causing massive uh, uh, activation of uh, the uh, clotting cascade at the site of vascular injury or, or, or damage. Of course, all of this is under controlling systems and this becomes important to us uh, for um, from therapeutic options with the uh, fibrinolytic pathway um, and also for the risk of thrombosis, uh, particularly in the venous systems. So we have inhibitors of both uh, fibrinolysis, uh, which we uh, utilise and you guys utilise uh, more readily for your um, uh, various uh, interventional uh, therapies, uh, as well as inhibitors in coagulation. Uh, and we think about these most commonly for some of the uh, inherited thrombophilias and the risk of uh, uh, venous thrombosis that can occur. So here we have antithrombin, uh, which as its name implies, has a very strong effect on thrombin, but also factor 10 and, uh, and other clotting factors. Uh, we have a tissue factor pathway inhibitor, uh, which is like its name implies, uh, acting on tissue factor. We don't, um, apart from heparin increasing release of this, we don't have very specific therapies at this stage that we use for tissue factor pathway inhibitor promotion. Uh, and we have the activated protein C uh, complex, which involves protein S. And this uh, uh, inactivates factor eight and factor five. And of course, people with protein C and protein S deficiency have a tendency of uh, thrombosis. And the more common but weaker uh, thrombophilia, of course, is a point mutation in factor five, 
uh, which is, um, makes it difficult for activated protein C to uh, inhibit uh, uh, activated uh, clotting factor 5. So we know about the uh, thrombophilias <clears throat> and we look for those in certain uh, clinical scenarios. Uh, and just briefly to point out some of those things that we discussed. So those natural anticoagulants that we've described and, and viewed there are very rare to have deficiencies, but very powerful as far as risk of thrombosis is concerned. Whereas uh, point mutations in clotting factors such as factor V laden are very common, but not so powerful as uh, um, promoting uh, venous thrombosis. So what we've described there obviously has a time sequence from the primary injury with vasoconstriction, the initial sticking of platelets to the uh, uh, site of injury, the aggregation of platelets, and then the development and attraction of clotting factors and fibrin uh, formation, and then the control so that we don't clot off our, all our limbs uh, with uh, fibrinolysis that follows that once stasis uh, has occurred. That old fashioned uh, classical hemostasis model uh, is not very useful, but it is useful just in when we're, as hematologists at least, interpreting some of the uh, laboratory uh, assays of hemostasis, mainly the APTT and PT slash INR. And you can see there that different uh, pathways relate to those clotting factors. So the intrinsic factor, intrinsic pathway and the common pathway will be seen uh, for the APTT, whereas the prothrombin time measures the extrinsic pathway and the common pathways. So uh, patients with different abnormalities in that will have different patterns, which will enable diagnosis of uh, various uh, coagulopathies. Uh, and some will affect one, uh, or both uh, of the um, uh, clotting factors, uh, clot clotting um, times. Just to remind you, um, looking back at the, um, at the schema that we showed, how some of our drugs uh, that we commonly use act, uh, our heparins, of course, promote uh, the very powerful antithrombin, uh, and that's uh, largely by its activity against factor 10, in fact, a thrombo and thrombin or 2A uh, for uh, unfractionated heparin, more specifically for uh, 10A for low molecular weight heparins. But as I mentioned, there's also a promotion of tissue factor pathway inhibitor uh, by uh, the heparin drugs. Warfarin, of course, uh, decreases uh, the clotting factors 7, 9, uh, uh, 10 and uh, thrombin, but also acts on the other vitamin K because all these are vitamin K dependent clotting factors. But, but protein C and protein S are also vitamin K dependent natural anticoagulants. And that's why we had the prothrombotic phase on warfarin therapy when we first initiate it and why we need to cover for uh, a good period of time. Uh, until the other clotting factors come down with an immediately acting anticoagulant such as uh, heparin. Um, and nowadays we're using the direct oral anticoagulants. And just to remind you those sites of, uh, 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 of action with, <clears throat> as the name implies, the direct 10A inhibitors, uh, Pixaban and uh, Rivaroxaban and some of the other injectables uh, and uh, the direct thrombin inhibitors most commonly, we're using dabigatran, and in some patients that we're using uh, in, uh, with HITS, we um, have direct uh, thrombin inhibitors that are infusional. So we don't monitor the direct anticoagulants. Sorry, dogs are going crazy. Uh, but uh, if we do, we will see abnormalities in um, the normal standard clotting factors, and we can look towards measuring the drug levels with um, specific uh, clotting uh, uh, assays such as um, the Pixaban anti-10A levels and uh, thrombin times that we dilute down to measure uh, dabigatran concentrations. So I'll stop there. Um,
we probably won't have any questions from that that talk, Steve. Uh, but I'm happy to to be involved uh, uh, later on with anything else. Oh, that was great. It never ceases to amaze me just how complicated the clotting cascade really is and how much I really don't understand it, which is why I go to you most often. <laughs> One question that um, I had for you, um, well, there's two actually while we're getting started. And by the way, for the um, people in the uh, attendees, feel free to use the chat or Q&A um, to ask questions. If you have them along the way, we'll endeavor to actually answer your questions. One of the questions that um, I have for you has, like when we do a thrombophilia screen and we're um, asking for that to be done, has that really changed um, over the last couple of years or is it still the basic um, 10 things we need to ask for? Yeah, you're right. So it's sort of stagnated at that level. So every now and then some other uh, mutations in you know, tissue factor pathway inhibitor or uh, plasmin, um, you know, PAI, PAI, uh, might come up, but really it's still the same as we used to to do it. So it hasn't uh, really changed from what we're ordering. I guess what you know, like you and you and I see, is that there's been a, a push for us, particularly hematologists who are, are prone to this, to order the thrombophilia screens uh, less commonly, because mostly, as you know, it's the clinical scenario that. Um, uh, guides what our, our clinical decisions uh, and our length of anticoagulation rather than the thrombophilias that we um, might or discover. Okay. Yeah, what, what, we haven't had any extra questions, but one other thing, and here in Australia, um, we're not reimbursed for asking for a thrombophilia screen on the first episode of an uh, acute thrombosis. Should we be asking for thrombophilia screens on their first uh, clot or waiting for their recurrence? Yeah, I think, I, I look, at, I think like you, I, like it doesn't often change um, decision making. Um, the advantage on doing it in some people on first clots um, might be for uh, associated people, for example, if you find something even soft like factor fibrillin, uh, that might be important for uh, a, a relative, such as a female relative who's getting pregnant, uh, and you might be looking for postpartum prophylaxis. So I think in general, it won't change uh, your treatment decisions, um, that the clinical scenario uh, changes that. But if there is, um, uh, peripheral advantage to doing that with with one clot, uh, then that might be useful. And then, as you know, sometimes we do it if the clots are, are, are weirdo clots, uh, particularly looking for something that might change our therapy, such as antiphospholipid antibodies, um, myeloproliferative diseases, etc. Cool. I just want to acknowledge Stephen Black's joined us from the UK. So, hi Stephen to everybody. I've got one question before we move on um, from the audience. We've got how often or reliable is fibrinogen level, especially during catheter-directed thrombolysis? So the, I mean, the assay itself is very reliable. Um, so, but uh, you obviously have an activated uh, situation. Uh, and so therefore you will start off with uh, high levels. Um, your levels will be dramatically reduced if you have uh, systemic uh, uh, fibrinolysis. Um, and therefore, they're reliable in that sense, but I mean, probably from a practical sense, and you can probably comment on this better than, uh, than me, whether you're doing anything about that, uh, particularly in someone who hasn't uh, any uh, clinical abnormalities of bleeding uh, is the other matter. Yeah, Steve, do you, do you mind if I comment there? Go for it, jump yeah, in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, agree with that point about practicality. We started off when we started our acute lysis protocol measuring for fibrinogen in everybody and obsessing about it. And all you found is you did a test that you then had to go, what the hell do I do with this? And if the patient isn't bleeding or unstable, it's quite unnerving if the fibrinogen is low. So we've kind of compromised now on that if we're running lytic for a long time, so if we go beyond 48 hours, then we'll do a fibrinogen level just to see where we're at. Uh, and if somebody has any bleeding issue, like bleeding nose or anything else, we'll do a fibrinogen level. And then we have a protocol to replace uh, fibrinogen as required at that point. Um, but otherwise, we don't measure it routinely because it just makes you 
uh, you know, have to panic about fibrinogen levels that go down because they always do if you're doing lysis for any length of time. Well, that makes sense. So we should take that off our protocols, hey? <laughs> All right. Well, I think we should move right along. And now I'm going to take the screen and just uh, hopefully get the right screen up. So have we got the right screen up, guys? Yes. Uh, fantastic. All right. So we're going to move on to throw. Uh, we're going to move on to um, Dr. Chris Rogan. He's an interventional radiologist at uh, the San City Adventist Hospital and the North Shore of Sydney, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Macquarie University Hospital, and uh, works very closely with us at RPA in our vascular unit. He's going to be talking about ileofemoral DVTs and acute treatment options. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks very much, Steve, for asking me to talk tonight on ileofemoral DVT, some of the options, especially the interventional side of things. My name is Chris Rogan. I'm an interventional radiologist. I um, practice mostly out of the world of Prince Alfred and Sydney Adventist Hospitals in Sydney. So let's start with the question of why is ileofemoral DVT different to femoropopliteal DVT? Well, firstly, definitionally, it involves the iliac or common femoral veins, plus or minus the cava. And therefore, it's functionally a complete limb outflow obstruction, which is different to femoropopliteal. The natural history, therefore, has a higher risk of adverse events, for instance, leg pain and swelling, risk of acute limb ischemia, risk of recurrent VTE, and risk of post thrombotic syndrome. In terms of approach, after ultrasound diagnosis, it's one where you may consider evaluating further with cross-sectional imaging, CT or MR venogram, to really know the upper end of the pathology. And for instance, on CT, you can have a look at the cable size, extent of cable thrombus or involvement, duplication or interruption of the cava, and also assess the iliac veins, plus or minus, is there evidence of Turner syndrome, retroferent neofibrosis or tumor that may be contributing or causing the underlying cause of the thrombosis and CTPA may or may not be indicated depending on symptoms of PE, which would be evaluated separately. And ileofemoral that may benefit from an interventional approach. Um, therefore, we may want to start unfractionated heparin as the initial anticoagulation um, rather than alternatives in those patients who are being considered for early thrombus removal approaches. So what are the options? Well, basically, we have standard care, which is anticoagulation, generally three months of oral anticoagulation. And I'll let the hematologist tell you a lot more about that. But then compression stockings. So practice varies on compression stockings. Um, there, there have been used for preventing symptoms or reducing symptoms and preventing PTS, but they've relatively fallen out of favor since the negative SOX randomized controlled trial showed that they didn't actually act to prevent post thrombotic syndrome. Also cable filters. I think the routine use of cable filters has now pretty much fallen out of favor. Um, and I see their role mostly in those who can only, who can't tolerate anticoagulation um, or are contraindicated. Um, and therefore they wouldn't be part of a lysis approach. In terms of use within lysis, you know, some people advocate this for floating cable thrombus, and I think that's reasonable in those really high risk cases, but in most cases, it's not necessary. So onto the bulk of the discussion, catheter directed thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Um, I think it should be considered definitely in certain situations. And then in other situations, there's a lower level of evidence, but there's still a reasonable um, reason for intervention, as long as everyone goes in understanding the evidence and understanding the pluses and minuses. So acute limb threat and cable thrombus is straightforward. These patients should have acute um, debulking of the clot. And in patients, in the subset of patients who are low risk for bleeding and who are younger, so under 65, with acute symptoms, these are the patients who have done reasonably well with um, pharmacomechanical and catheter-directed lysis, 
And so if they are symptomatic, I think that's definitely an indication for intervention and if they fall within those, uh, those previously listed categories. And we know that these patients have early improvement in DVT symptoms and early improvement in quality of life due to restoring flow. But there's other reasons which aren't as strong in the literature, but, but have a definite effect and that's reducing the severity of post-thrombotic syndrome and improving long-term disease specific quality of life with a modest benefit. Surgical thrombectomy also has a place, uh, especially in acute, um, the acute limb and in the patients where thrombolysis is contraindicated or unavailable. So I think most surgeons now would look to an endovascular first approach for, um, for this, but of, of course, um, surgical thrombectomy is a good fallback in those patients who are contraindicated or there's no local thrombolysis service available. Um, and there was a meta-analysis in JBS in 2012 with 15 studies which showed a decreased incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome and venous reflux for surgical thrombectomy in this group. So the open vein hypothesis underlies the kind of rationale for intervention. And the basic question is, does early thrombus removal lead to longer term functional benefit with early vein clearance preserving valve function? So the interest in this hypothesis kind of, it, it, it's got a, it's kind of a logic to it, which of course led to the first early trials. And you can see some listed on the, on the right there, but one key one was the Cavent study. And the Cavent study looked just at oleofemoral DVT and actually found a number needed to treat of only four patients in order to reduce frequency of post-thrombotic syndrome. Didn't actually improve quality of life and they said, we need further evaluation. So thus two important trials were set up um, which we'll just briefly go through. I'm gonna skip all the details of the track study in the interest of time. But basically the track study was a multi-center RCT to compare standard of care, anticoagulation to standard plus catheter-directed lysis. In the, and there's some details of the trial there, but what I wanna to skip to, because most will know the trial, is actually the subgroup analysis. So, Unfortunately, the trial didn't meet its primary endpoint, which was that there was no difference in the occurrence of PTS, um, which was their primary endpoint. But they did find some secondary endpoints that were relevant, especially in the ILF femoral subgroup analysis. And that's reduced severity of post-thrombotic syndrome, fewer patients with the kind of disabling moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome, a greater reduction in leg pain and swelling, especially um, early on, and greater improvement in venous disease specific quality of life measure there was a risk of bleeding was increased 1.5 versus 0.5%. And there was a small differential uh, working against catheter-directed lysis of recurrent VTE. Um, so the quality of life sub, um, analysis, which was published separately, you can see on the top left there, um, measured quality of life with um, the venous insufficiency specific quality of life tool and measured a baseline in six months and 12 months and 18 and 24 months. And we can see from the graph there, the blue and red lines and essentially the red line um, and versus the blue line represents aliofemoral with no clot retrieval versus with clot removal. And there was a significant difference in quality of life in the kind of one, especially the one and six month ranges and then a more modest reduction in the 12 and in 24 month. Um, as expected, and as most of you are aware from the overall analysis um, and the femoropopliteal subgroup analysis, there is no, different, no significant difference at all time points. The Dutch CAVA trial was done along similar lines, but restricted to ileofemoral DVT patients and run across the Netherlands at 15 hospitals, standard of care, this time versus ECOS ultrasound assisted thrombolysis. And uh, essentially they use the protocol you can see there, UK and then UK infusion and adjunctive suction, angioplasty and stent was allowed. And their same primary endpoint of patients with PTS this time at 12 months was not met. So no statistically significant difference. And they had a difference in the major bleeding rate. So this was a kind of disappointing outcome for this trial. Um, they also looked at recurrent thrombosis, which was higher in the intervention group, but this is because stents were placed, which could then go down. So um, that kind of explains that higher recurrent thrombosis risk. Uh, 
But from the track trial, we have the indications for CVT, which is iliofemoral disease in patients who are not old, so under 65, and who have symptoms. Therefore, we can reduce their symptoms um, and look at targeting those early quality of life measures. And also patients, especially in selected very young patients and fit patients, we can talk about the reduced severity of PTS and the less severe PTS, um, which, uh, which patients can get. So we're just essentially choosing the patients who are going to be winners, who are, who are ambulant, who are, who are young, who have low risk of bleeding, and, uh, and especially if they have significant symptoms from their clot, then they can benefit from catheter-directed lysis. There's a whole bag of contraindications you can see there. I don't need to go through them all individually, but these are some of the contraindications for lysis. Um, and you know these patients, you may um, head towards um, conservative management or surgical management, depending on the severity of the disease. Um, so patient prep, pretty standard, history, physical exam, check their medications, allergies, uh, IV access, monitoring, consent for the procedure, Foley catheter if we think it's going to be long, probably a good idea because they're going to be in bed with an infusion catheter. Um, there should be on unfractionated heparin and we're going to start and we're going to have a lysis order, either UK or TPA, depending on your hospital protocol. The procedure, basically the overview is we're going to access ideally below the thrombus so we can get to, we can have good inflow and we can get to all the disease and perform venography. Decide then if we're going to perform a stage treatment um, and we're going to incorporate catheter-directed lysis or, or, or pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. Decide on IVC filter in those few patients who they might be indicated in, because then one would probably come in jugular or from the contralateral leg and place that filter. Thrombus is, is generally crossed and uh, catheter-directed or pharmacomechanical thrombectomy set up or aspiration thrombectomy performed. And then if there is good restoration of flow, and but there is a physical obstructive lesion, then it, then you may need a balloon or stent to maintain that flow. There's no point, obviously, performing the whole lysis and cleaning the, the uh, limb out to then leave a critical lesion, which will simply cause the whole thing to have a low flow state and to and to shut down again. Um, yeah, so it may go that way with a, a adjunctive angioplasty and stent, or maybe be that and after running off a, a extensive time of, of thrombectomy that we haven't got the results that, that we'd hoped for. So then catheter directed lysis can be a good fallback position for that and then recheck at 24 hours and, and the same thing. So a simple case example would be an example of May Thurner syndrome, um, simple femoral access um, and uh, clot demonstrated as, a, as initially an, an occlusive appearance. Subsequently, catheter-directed lysis, cleaning of the segment, identification of the underlying stenosis, which is stented and then with good flow result. Um, slightly more complex example is a young patient I treated last year with um, extensive femoropopliteal and, and iliac and cable thrombus. And this patient, she also had um, some degree of cable stenosis, which we'll see later, uh, but quite extensive th thrombolysis. This lady was interesting in that someone attempted thrombolysis uh, the week previously and, and, and the whole thing just went down again. And I, and I suspect that's because there was still underlying um, pathology. So in her case, I chose tibial access. It doesn't matter that you could be popliteal because you just need to be below the level of the pathology to ensure good inflow. And um, we see occlusion at the femoral level bilaterally. After catheter directed lysis, I also performed um, angiojet of the iliax bilaterally and had reasonable clearance. I actually thought this patient may have a Methana syndrome, but then the bilateral disease goes against that. Um, and uh, so I used additional IVUS just to check out the cava and just skipping forward. So her jugular access in her was useful because you could have bilateral access. And I feel she actually had hold up in the, in the cava. Uh, 
um, which was confirmed on IBIS and the left common ILAC was confirmed to be within normal limits on IBIS. And interestingly, her left renal outflow was abnormal. She had some coexistent kind of nutcracker as well, although the super renal cava was normal. Um, there was hemiazygous outflow of the kidney and her flow improved significantly after balloon of the cava. I chose because she was in her twenties not to um, stent that and there seemed to be a reasonable response to a balloon. Um, and she achieved a good result in the end. And this has been patent in the in the long term for her. Um, and I think the key is just to do the necessary to achieve good flow characteristics, um, not to kind of stop and accept a um, a uh, suboptimal flow because it will go down. And post treatment CT scan, almost all of her um, treatment stayed open. She did end up reclotting off the right. Um, femoral vein but the iliacs and the left femoral and uh, the cava all stayed open in her so we, we were pleased with her, that result okay so some little technical things um popliteal axis is pretty routine um prone or supine but sometimes prone can be awkward um, because the sheath observations and the sedation is harder, especially if you're having to do your own sedation in the prone position. Um, there's a risk of hematoma. You can consider accessing the SSV or gastrocnemius veins as, as well, which will allow you to get towards the bottom of the popliteal vein. Um, it's a pretty standard approach, but it can also be done supine. There's a small paper and, and I've got a, a small number of cases where we had just access medially in the supine position with the leg externally rotated, which is a good option, especially if you want to also have femoral or jugular access in that patient, which would be, you know, um, much, much simpler in the supine position. Femoral access is easy. Um, that's our mainstay. Um, if there's only iliac disease, jugular access um, allows for cable and bilateral treatments. Obviously, a hematoma is more of an issue. External jugular access is an alternative. Um, and tibial access, um, I, I think more frequently used more recently and, and quite good because it allows a less awkward supine position, can improve inflow. You know, it's possible to um, run catheter-directed lysis and, and get the inflow good for right from the bottom uh, and then uh, address higher up disease later. Um, and posterior tibial veins actually drain a large area of the calf and you can just externally rotate the ankle and access in the superficial area. But I think it got a limitation up to six French and, you know, some of the, um, certainly the um, angiojet slant uh, and the eight French uh, system uh, would be a squeeze through there. So some of the systems available, catheter active thrombolysis, ultrasound assisted, ECOS, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, various devices we'll talk about, balloon and wire disruption, um, just to agitate the clot and then, uh, of course, angioplasty and stent as required. So chemical catheter-directed thrombolysis is just delivered. Normally, uh, we use these two infusion catheters in my hospital. Craig McNamara is a valved infusion catheter, which is convenient because uh, the, the valved end obviously stops flow out of the distal aspect of the um, catheter and encourages flow through the side ports, whereas the fountain infusion system achieves the same thing, but it requires an occluding wire. And this occluding wire can sometimes be a little bit um, awkward to pass through the device when it's up and over. Um, you need to make sure it's well flushed and you need to make sure the hemostasis valve is on before the occluding wire goes in. Otherwise you'll have to take the occluding wire all the way out and place it back in again to uh, get the wire to sit in the right spot. And your jet Zalant DVT, this is one of the ma uh, mainstay options. It's an eight French 105 centimeter system. Um, there's, there's the Omni proxy and uh, Dista mostly for arterial work. And this is a power pulse um, infusion, which is essentially where one might infuse a, a bolus on the table um, to soften the clot and prepare it. Um, ranges are kind of 250 to 500,000 units of UK, for example, or in the range of 12 to 25 milligrams of TPA, <clears throat> dwell time of about 20 to 40 minutes, or as long as the operator can be patient for. 
and then um, and then proceed with the thrombectomy part itself, which kind of uses a rheolytic thrombectomy, which is a, a suction created um, by these uh, high velocity saline jets, which uh, which suck the thrombus in. ECOS is ultrasound assisted. It's essentially an infusion catheter together with an ultrasonographic core wire, which uh, which is supposed to increase penetration and improve the lytic dispersion and unwind the fibrin um, strands. Um, so it's essentially like catheter-directed lysis to use technically, but with the addition of the ultrasound. Um, and it's quite a well-established role in um, pulmonary embolus um, and can be used in DVT as well, as it was in the, in the, in the uh, Dutch trial. The number indigo is an aspiration thrombectomy catheter. Most would use the CAT8, and the good thing about it is it comes with the Torx and X-Torx um, angle tip variant, so it can be angled and steered to engage clot on the sides. Um, I think this mostly has a role just for soft clot, um, a kind of completely occluded, softly clotted vessel. I think anything that's kind of um, more established clot sticking on the walls. This is relatively um, less uh, effective and compared to the side firing um, angiojet, um, but I think it still has a role and uh, these catheters are very soft and easily directable and can be used without a wire kind of naked um, down uh, through, the, um, through the clot. And there is a separator wire. It's slightly awkward to use. I think I'll, I'll talk about another device which kind of addresses that weakness. The trellis was a good device which used a, it was Covidian. Unfortunately, it's been withdrawn from the market. Basically, it created a closed segment between the two occlusion balloons and it had this wire which spun around to create an egg beater style disruption of the clot where an infusion of um, light lytic into that segment. And I, I really like this device, but unfortunately it was withdrawn and hasn't been replaced. It's possible to do a poor man's trellis with kind of using a Fogarty balloon to get a slightly closed segment and then a, and then a glide wire to do that clot disruption as well. So sometimes you can use that along with the other techniques. And the jet eye is a relatively new to market from Walk Vascular in California. Um, this is essentially like a penumbra catheter, um, although it's not steerable, unfortunately yet. It comes in six and eight French devices for arterial and venous. And it has this little jet inside the um, inside the lumen um, of the catheter, which actually just acts to break up the clot as it's engaged in the mouth of the of the aspiration um, catheter. And this I found to be really quite effective, um, and that it doesn't get clotted, and so it it, it can just work slowly through the clot um, systematically and without needing to take it out or or use a separator wire. Um, it's not steerable though, so I think using it through an angled sheath is, is ideal because then it can engage the sides of the vessel. The Angiovac is, is a beast. I haven't used it personally. I'd be interested to hear if any have. Uh, in Australia, uh, it's a 22 French device that requires extracorporeal circulation, and GA, and uh, has this large funnel tip you can see here. Um, it sounds fantastic for cable and atrial thrombus, but uh, I haven't had much exposure in Australia. And what, when do we use what technology? Well, poor inflow is a difficult situation. I, um, I think in the track trial, they used CDT for poor inflow on day one and then, and then pharmacomechanical on day two. Um, early soft clot, I think most things will work. Uh, larger veins sometimes struggle with penumbra alone. Um, and I like the Jedi through an angled sheath or the, or um, obviously the penumbra has some angle to it itself. Um, but I think with early soft clot, almost anything works. When there's more subacute component against the wall, which kind of gets stuck um, along the walls, I think personally, just the personal experience that the Andrew Jet Salon has, is good at this because it's got those side firing kind of um, approach and uh, can, can work away at that kind of subacute stuff. Um, I thought uh, I had the uh, initial impression that we wouldn't want to create a flow channel and input catheter directed lysis, but uh, subsequent feedback, I think you know there is a role for that too. So I, I think either way, um, the catheter directed lysis, whether it's upfront or secondary, is a helpful fallback position. Um, and trellis isn't isn't uh, available, but you can create a closed system with occlusion balloons, as per that image I popped up.
So we won't spend long on this patient management. They're in HDU or ICU. Um, they've got catheter directed infusion orders, um, looking around um, 80 to 100,000 units per hour for urokinase, which is what we use. Um, concomitant heparin, they should all be on um, uh, systemic heparin as per protocols and monitoring. Um, I'll skip over this. Fibrinogen levels can be used for monitoring. Uh, we don't routinely use them. Um, they could be used in high risk patients, for example. And afterwards, um, they after they have a good result, uh, we take everything out, manual pressure's enough, um, of course, and then um, they're going to go on to um, unfractionated heparin or switch to low molecular weight and then transition across to oral therapy and then discharge and follow up plans. Um, there's some complication uh, rates. This is an older article, but it was the standards for JBIR, looking at thresholds um, to stop in, stop in practice if the, these are met. And this should be the average threshold. Um, so finally, Although there's been some disappointing data from um, the, the two big trials, there this is in regards to just meeting the primary endpoint, but the subgroup analysis of allofemoral DBT in a tract and um, essentially means that if we can choose patients who are going to be winners, patients who have symptoms, patients who are low bleeding risk and under 65, then these patients have a definite benefit in terms of their quality of life, especially earlier on, and their symptoms. That they, they will improve. Um, anticoagulation remains standard of care for all other, other patients and all patients who can have it should have anticoagulation. Um, and um, there are a variety of approaches technically and devices, there's a large variety. Um, the access route and device choice is essentially individualized to what's available in your hospital and, uh, and the individual patient. Um, Staging is, is a very valid approach with catheter-directed lysis overnight plus pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, either on day one or day two. And I think if you're going to go to all this trouble to clear things, you have to commit and finish the job with ballooning or stenting as required to ensure that you've got good inflow and outflow characteristics. So thanks very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to uh, learning from all the other presenters tonight. We can see the, those conclusions, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll stick to the discussion. Some of the um, questions were quite interesting. Okay. There's a lot of debate about the trials and their eff efficacy and actually telling us what how good uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis are. Um, Steve, whilst we've got you here, do you have any thoughts upon those trials and whether they're actually that useful? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... Um uh, Ander Cohen, uh, who some of you may know, is one of my colleagues, and he's published about 30 papers in New, New England Journal of Medicine, so I can't compare to his lofty heights, but, you know, he, his comments and trials is, is only relevant in as much as they apply to your patient population and what you see, because the trial is specific to that. So we have no evidence beyond two years of anticoagulation on anyone, for example, because the trials don't go that far. So it's always important to interpret them in that broader context. I think ATRACT has been hammered uh, by a number of people, but it still is a randomized trial. I think the main issue for me is that um, the technique used for lysis and ATRACT was extremely limited. It's older techniques, no patients were followed up. They didn't do duplex scanning on the patients afterwards to look for patency. And that ultimately that endpoint, if you look at the second data table in ATRACT, which looks at the, 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 the uh, um, binary outcomes of uh, were patients better and at every single time point patients are better in ATRAC than they are if they had lysis than if they didn't so you downstage the PTS and everybody across that population and for me my patients with mild PTS are not bothered by it if they've moderate to severe PTS that's the real problem for them and the moderate to severe group are reduced in ATRAC for all comers so it's just about how the trial was set up for primary endpoints and they had to report to that so there's enough in there to, to look at your own patients and go for iliofemoral patients. Absolutely, there's benefit for those patients. You may not cure PTS, but you certainly make it better. Um, and in modern techniques, we're starting to see bigger gains. So, you know, we're running clear DVT now, and that's definitely showing an improvement. We're running at a PTS rate overall of about 5% halfway through that cohort study at the moment. So, you know, uh, it, 
we're moving forward and, uh, and I'm sure A-Track will be a legacy trial along that journey in due course. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I noticed that you actually answered uh, you and Macaulay's question about um, thrombus uh, lysis in the direction that you actually treat it from. Did you want to make a, a comment for the, the audience on that for everybody or? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, I think Litic, when you're approaching a patient with lysis, you're trying to get inflow. It's a bit like the opposite direction to arteries. You want flow coming because that augments lysis. So if you're going to run Litic catheters and you're starting to get flow coming up from the calf and through the femoral vein, your lysis gets better and better. So getting that inflow going early is, is, is helpful. Most of the time with a CBT catheter, you can cross the whole of the lesion. So the McNamara is 50 centimeters. You can typically have the tip of the catheter in the patent IVC and the bottom of the catheter will be down near the popliteal vein, so you, you can cover most of it. For the mechanical devices, I like to clear the clot from bottom up with the aspiration mm -hmm. mode. Once you've sprayed the lytic in, you infuse lytic across the whole length, but then clear from bottom up, because that just reduces a little bit of the hem hemolysis effect you get. If you're using angiojet or jetai, any of these devices in flowing blood, that's where you get the, the real big impact on the kidney. So if you clear it, from the bottom up, you also reduce the chance of a PE and then you just leave that plug to the end, take that out, and then you've got the whole thing open. That's the kind of preferred way I, I, I have of approaching it. But, you know, these are my own opinions, right? So, <laughs> who knows? Well, thanks, Stephen. That's that's really great to hear your thoughts, Stephen. I, if I could just jump in, I, one of the things I really relates to what you said, I, I have concern if you, Say if you cut a flow channel through the center of a clot on a, on a mm. pharmacomechanical device like an angiojet mm. and then want to follow up with catheter-directed lysis, it's, it's, it's quite ineffective. So you're much better either choosing at the beginning, oh yeah, I'll go catheter-directed lysis and obtain what gain I can and then, and then suck it all out or just doing pharmacomechanical from the beginning you know, as, as thoroughly as possible, bottom to top, as you said. So I think I agree with you, but what do you think about, yeah, I mean, it seems, less effective if we follow up with the catheter directed as a second stage rather than the other way around? Uh, oh, actually, ironically, I think um, I'd probably directly go the opposite direction on this one. And we, we kind yeah. of analyzed um, our patients. We did 180. It will be, it's, it's accepted in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery. So it will be out later on this month. We, we compared a group that we, of 80 patients where we had done angiojet and 80 mm -hmm. patients where we had just done CDT. And if mm -hmm. we followed a strategy of angiojet first with a little bit of lysis afterwards, what we did was significantly reduce the total lytic time by about a day overall. And the, the effectiveness was pretty much comparable, but you got a big reduction in cost and a big reduction in total treatment time if you start with power pulse angiojet up front. In the cases okay. where we used rescue angiojet, in other words, CDT hadn't worked mm -hmm. after two or three days, it did nothing. So if your clot's not gone after two days of CDT, angiojet or anything else is not going to clear it because it's all chronic stuff. So I, I tend right. to find that we get the, the cleanest results with a really good go of angiojet and then a, a lytic catheter running the full length of the clot, some lytic in overnight, and then balloon venoplasty and stenting the following day. So we tend to follow that. But you know, again, you know, this is a, a kind of experience thing. You've got to do what, what, what you feel is working best for you in your hands with your center and your experience. So you have slightly different protocols. So I, I don't think this is about saying right or wrong. This is just a slight variation. No, that, that's great insight. And Steve Dubanik, if you don't mind, can I ask Steve one more question, which is technical, which yeah. is in terms of the, I think one of the biggest challenges is this adhesive mural, this is kind of mural thrombus that sticks to the side that may be a kind of more, that might even be an older component of that. Um, do you have, like, I guess the, the angiojet being side firing or using like something that can direct the catheter, aspiration catheter to the side may address that, but do you have a preferred approach for that kind of, um, whether where the clot may be just sticking to the sides of the vein, essentially, after an initial run of angiojet. Yeah, so I think that's why we've tended to use CDT um, more frequently in angiojet. I, I've spoken to a lot of people like uh, Kush Desai in the States and Mahmoud Razavi and various others. They seem to get a lot of success with single-stage therapy, and the same as Jerry in, in Ireland. We, we've found typically that you always have something left behind after angiojet. I, I very rarely see cases where you've got such a great result that you go, you know, that's, that's, mm. that's awesome, we're done. 
And that's why we tend to use CDT overnight afterwards. And, and the combination just takes that from a three, four day procedure down to a, a, an overnight sort of thing. Uh, and then if you use a little bit of balloon venoplasty at the end just to squash that stuff, and then typically that's going to be harder, more adherent clot. And often you'll find the veins actually is wasting at that point, and you're going to put a stent in that. And by the time you've done all of that, it, it looks fine, right? So I, I think um, you just got, it's a combination of things. None of the, not one of the devices, in Jetai, Angiojet, Penumbra, all of them on the market, clear that really sticky adherent clot in, in, in the sort of time that, that, that we need. Also with Angiojet, you can be a little bit um, more pragmatic about the time. You know, the, 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 mm. the time that they've got on that device for 300 seconds comes, comes from some really kind of yeah. basic science uh, questionable data that they use. The most are quite liberal with it, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, as long as you, you've got a little bit left of gas in the tank, you can spray it and suck it and blast <laughs> with a balloon and, you know. Well, there's a couple of extra questions that have just popped up. And for one, uh, one, the first question was when you position the catheter, I mean, they're asking, uh, do you try and bury the catheter completely in the clot or concentrate the urokinase TPA and have the catheter out at the, into the IVC, which I assume will be a, a patent vessel? Yeah, you so... Know? You know, this is why it's different from arterial lysis. When, when we started with this, if you have a single end hole catheter, you're spraying it out the front. So actually what you want is to try and distribute as much of that lytic as equally as you can across the clot and start getting some flow coming back into it, which is why a heparin infusion through the side port is also helpful because it just starts generating a little bit of flow through the vessel. So I try and have the tip of the catheter at the, just outside the clot at the top. So you just, you're distributing the bulk of the lytic through the clot, but you're starting to then open things up top and bottom from flow channels that are coming through and that flow then augments all the lytic and helps to uh, you know get natural fibrinolysis working as well if there's no outflow at the top end you will always doesn't matter how much lytic you pour in it's just static and it keeps clotting keeps clotting so you want to start getting flow through the whole system yeah the other question that, uh, as we move along was um, a Mayferna lesion how protective is it against PEs when you're using Angiojet to clear an iliac DVT or do you consider a filter as required in these situations yeah so that's a great question and people always ask about using filters I think the Mayferna lesion is protective to an extent uh, but actually, overall, PE is not a big problem in these patients. Uh, and you get far more problems from putting filters in. So I think, um, you know, filters, we hardly ever use them. In, that, in those patients we looked at over now, over 200 and something that we've done in the last three or four years, we've used filters in one patient. Uh, and that patient had already right heart strain and a big PE. So if you don't have, so we, we look at the CT venogram, if you've got a big dilated right side of the heart and you've got a heavy clot burden, I put a filter it. Also, if you're starting your practice in the beginning, using a filter is helpful just to protect you from that, that really big, oh fuck moment when somebody dies on the table and all your colleagues start to come and tell you what the hell are you doing, you shouldn't be doing this. You kind of just want to have that little... Uh, protective net, uh, you know, but you've got to make sure you take it out. Once you, you're happy with your protocol, you've got clock breaking up, there's lytic circulating, PE really isn't an issue. So you, you kind of just focus on getting clot out. There's natural lytic going on, you're infusing TPA, which does do some systemic work or urokinase, and then, you know, focus on, you know, the, the leg without worrying too much about PE. It's not a big issue. Just one last question before we move on, and that was just uh, with an angiojet. They're asking, do we mean pulse spray lysis or pharmacomechanical thrombectomy? Um, anyone want to answer that one? It's a um, dual, isn't I, it? I normally, I normally do both, but I just yeah. I, I want to hear yeah. what Steve has to say more. Yeah, I think angiojet works far better if you use the pulse spray mode first, and then you use the aspiration mode. So if you just use aspiration mode, it's really not as effective. So that pulse spray really does help to break things up and get things going, get the lytic into it, particularly with the new catheter. So I, I would normally like to use angiojet, fa favor using it as pulse spray up front, then aspiration, and then if you need some tidying up, you put a CDT catheter in and run it overnight. That's, uh, that's kind of the, the strategy we follow. What's, what's the duration of the power pulse before you start the actual aspiration? I mean, an hour, four, 
No, so the power pulse. No, it's just twenty. Infusing the power pulse takes you about 10, 15 minutes to to power pulse the whole length of the vein. But then what you want to do is give the lytic a chance to work. So you know, go and take your gloves off, have a cup of coffee, come back about a half an hour later is what we normally yep. do, and then you do yep. the aspiration mode. So you know, the longer you you give it, the you know lytic works, and you start to clear things out. You've got less to aspirate out at the end. Yeah. One last thing, uh, lysis is do, does everyone think GA is mandatory or are we doing it under sedation as well? I don't think so. For the stenting bit, we, we tend to do GA. So we tend to start the lysis under local and then if we know they need a stent, we give them the GA for the stent because that venoplasty is painful. Yep. Uh, but if you have really good conscious sedation, you can probably get away with it in the acute patients. I think chronics are a different story, but you know, starting lysis and doing angiojet, you can certainly cope with under, uh, under sedation. That's, it's not mandatory GA for that, I wouldn't think. Certainly, um, from our experience, we've found that um, some of the younger patients don't tolerate um, don't tolerate uh, uh, thrombolysis uh, without a GA, um, despite our best efforts at uh, conscious sedation. But um, uh, some of the older patients seem to tolerate it a bit better. Yep. Well, that's a perfect way that we can move into your uh, talk, Jonathan. Jonathan Langton is an interventional radiologist at the Sunshine Coast uh, University Hospital in Queensland. And he's been schooled in Aberdeen, as you can tell by his accent. He's a com uh, completing his uh, formal IR training with a two-year fellowship at Monash Univers uh, Hospital in Melbourne in 2018. And he does about... 20,000 nautical miles of sailing between his uh, medical school and his current job at the Sunshine Coast. I'm sure he didn't do that all in one go. Our flight would have been very good. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Jonathan, if you can take the screen and entertain us for a little while. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, um, so uh, the previous talk covered quite a lot of what my talk <laughs> is about and certainly the uh, Q&A discussion, but uh, here goes. So uh, tonight I'm talking on the use of venous stents during and after thrombolysis. Um, and uh, as many Dr. of you- Dr. Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan, you have please to try reshare again. Okay, the other screen, please. Oh. Okay, share screen. How's that? Is that working? Uh, this is a presenter screen, doctor. Oh. It looks like my oh. issue. Not <laughs> oh, the main screen. You are the main one. Um, okay. Okay. Let's. Here we go. Working? Perfect. Okay, so um, uh, I'm talking about the use of stenting during uh, thrombolysis. Uh, and as with many of you, my, most of my formal training uh, has predominantly been arterially focused. Um, so moving into this venous reconstructive space has pro proven to be both exciting and very challenging. Um, we're very fortunate here at Sunshine Coast University Hospital to uh, have one of the first CT hybrid suites in the Southern Hemisphere, which I'd like to showcase in uh, case three this evening. Um, in addition to this, we have two angio labs, uh, multiple ultrasounds and uh, an angio jet, uh, which for most of these cases is what is used. Um, and uh, Currently, we do not have IVUS, but we have used it several times. Uh, now, um, we've had a consistent uh, 
been his caseload for a number of years, but has have certainly re recently noticed a dev, uh, an increase or surge in referrals, which I think reflects the uh, building medical evidence towards proactive management of acute iliofemoral DVT and chronic venous conditions uh, that has been showcased in this forum. Um, a recent audit of ours has indicated that we are achieving an e excellent early stent patency rate and a similar long-term patency rate uh, as, as the published date, data. Um, but as alluded to by uh, Associate Professor Valalba last time, I think this could be improved with better patient selection. Um, I won't go uh, too much into this slide because it's already been covered, um, but it, it's this evidence base that has led us to having a very proactive uh, approach to venous and, and acute venous uh, occlusive disease. And we like to try to get to patients within two weeks. Um, uh, as uh, discussed by Dr. Rogan, uh, we feel uh, cross-sectional imaging is very important, uh, not only to identify the upper extent of the clot, but to uh, elicit the underlying or causative lesion, if any. And of course, if they have a lesion, we use that uh, as a protective mechanism uh, rather than going to uh, uh, filter insertion. Uh, so we aim to do a one-step pharmamechanical thromb uh, thrombolysis and stenting in the same sitting. Uh, it's not always possible, but, but that is our primary goal. Uh, all, all lesions get balloon preparation and, and these chronic uh, lesions often require a Kevlar balloon. Uh, and our aim with stenting um, is to restore flow and we keep stenting until flow uh, is restored. Um, and of course we use, um, uh, when we don't have IVUS available or other adjuncts, we uh, use the medial margin of the contralateral L5 pedicle. Uh, so now I'm gonna move on to the first of uh, several cases tonight. Uh, addressing the topic of uh, when to uh, stent during or after thrombolysis. Um, so the first case um, was quite challenging for me because it was uh, early on in my venous career um, and an 18 year old female presented with uh, uh, as often is the case of permissive lesion uh, which in this case was triggered by severe dehydration due to diarrhea and vomiting over Christmas, uh, and she was also on an oral contraceptive pill. As you can see from the CT, she's got a maternal configuration with acute clot expanding her iliac, external iliac and extending into her femoral vein. Uh, associated with this is severe limb swelling. Now, she did also have a previous history of DVT and PE in 2016, uh, whilst on the oral contraceptive pill, but that wasn't investigated other than a, a CTPA any further. Uh, and she went on to anticoagulation. So um, the initial run, uh, as expected from the CT, demonstrated extensive iliac clot and collaterals. Uh, you can see they're crossing the pelvis uh, before entering the contralateral side and supplying the IVC. Post thrombolysis, I managed to achieve uh, reduced collaterals, but as you can see, there are several areas of persisting clot. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, at this stage, the uh, maternal lesion is untreated. Uh, so once I was happy, I cleared enough clot with angiojet. Uh, I went on to treat the primary lesion, which in this case, um, you can see uh, severely wasted the, the balloon before uh, eventually releasing under pressure. Um, at this point, it was very easy to move the 12 millimeter balloon between the external iliac vein and the IVC. Uh, and um, due to my inexperience and the inavailability of IVUS at the time, being it was the 2nd of January or something, um, I decided to, because of her age, uh, withhold from uh, stenting at that time. And this was the end result. Uh, so as you can see, it looks quite ratty, um, but 
uh, there's good forward flow and clearance of contrast, uh, and I've got rid of all the collaterals. Um, but I think if I had had Ivis at the time and the experience I have now, I definitely would have reached for the stents. But uh, as the astute of you will know in the audience, I've put a a part A on this, uh, and that bears the omen of a part B. So um, despite an initial good result to my treatment, which permitted her discharge on anticoagulation and with compressive hosiery, uh, this was short-lived. And clinic follow-up demonstrated that she had moderate uh, PTS, uh, despite an absence of DVT or NEP on subsequent imaging. Um, so, uh, we decided to take her back uh, and give her more definitive treatment given the persistence of uh, what were intolerable symptoms. Um, so, uh, the initial run demonstrated that the groundwork I'd put in in the uh, case uh, eight months earlier um, uh, was still standing and there was no uh, residual clot or scarring of the iliac vein, but you can see the may turn a lesion very clearly, although it's permitting a minimal amount of contrast passage, she is relying heavily on uh, sacral collateral and lumbar collateral networks. Um, but given the groundwork was already in place, this was swiftly treated uh, with a 14 by 60 millimeter stent, uh, which restored inline flow and rapid relief of symptoms. Um, one, one of the points uh, which was addressed earlier I'd like to uh, emphasize is uh, you can see with that methernal lesion in place that uh, there is very restricted flow and, and, and it's that reassurance uh, that I gained from that image that, you know, when you're doing your angiojet or, or me mechanical thrombolysis, um, uh, th there's not much large, uh, large clot's going to get through and into the lungs. Uh, so case number two uh, is a 44-year-old 44, 44 uh, commercial tuna fisherman who presented with a two-week history of uh, pain and swelling in the leg with acute iliofemoral DVT on ultrasound. Uh, and as you can see from the CT, uh, he has a Maytherna configuration and acute uh, iliofemoral DVT extending into his swollen left leg. Now, um, your initial venograms in these cases can all, often look quite daunting, uh, which does take some time to get used to uh, having a predominantly arterial background. But uh, I found by aiming a wire and catheter towards the spinous process of L5, um, is a useful target for, for and a stiff glide uh, loop usually pushes through uh, these clots swiftly. Um, and you can always keep yourself out of too much trouble with regular contrast injections. Uh, but as you can see with the bloom preparation stage, um, once the clot was cleared, um, despite his acute presentation, uh, there are obviously a number of chronic uh, restrictive lesions which were resistant to, to plasty. Um, so not only does the balloon stage help with uh, sizing of stents, but it also confirms the location of lesions uh, and where you need to go uh, with the stents in the absence of IVUS or other adjuncts. Uh, so uh, the end result was achieved with a 14 by 80 uh, millimeter stent and you can see that the extensive iliac and femoral uh, uh, mechanical, uh, pharma mechanical thromb thrombolysis has worked well. Although there is some minimal residual clot burden there, we were comfortable uh, and, and uh, with the knowledge of the prior case that uh, most of that gets mopped up uh, with uh, the um, ongoing anticoagulation you do want to be careful that there's no uh, larger clots there that could uh, result in a very uh, short-term uh, stent occlusion. 
so this is my last case, uh, and it's really showcasing uh, the CT Angio hybrid uh, theater and uh, a novel use of balloon and the uh, CT uh, that we used to work through a very complex case. This was a 46 year old female with acute bilateral iliofemoral DVT extending into the IVC. She was under investigation for a pelvic cystic mass um, and had a, 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 a long, uh, sorry, a history of some illness many, many years ago, um, which resulted in some uh, left flank pain. Uh, and on CT, we were surprised to find she had a calcified left renal vein and a large calcified thrombus. You can see this is one I've accidentally put in one of the later CTs. She's actually got an IVC filter there, and I'll go on to explain why. So uh, initial angiogram, as, as expected from the CT, uh, demonstrated extensive acute on chronic thrombus worse on the left with the calcified mass in the IVC at the level of the renal vein. Um, now she had multiple attempts at clearing this thrombus, uh, including overnight uh, uh, indwelling catheters and things to try and uh, reduce the clot burden. Um, and um, because of the complexity of the case, uh, we uh, decided to put an IVC filter in situ because we didn't know how adherent this calcified mass was or, or what it actually was at the time. So we put that protective measure in, uh, A, to prevent any um, uh, escape of clot, but also uh, to control the location of uh, this unknown quantity. So she was presented at a vascular MVT and a range of treatment options were discussed uh, proposed. These ranged from open surgery to uh, loop, uh, snare, and forcep extraction to a peripheral location uh, before cut down. Um, but given the fact that it was in a very uh, intrahepatic IVC location, we decided that open surgery was uh, with it in that location would be very uh, uh, challenging and um, we were also worried that if we did loop snare this thing, were we going to be able to A, control it in the uh, endovascular space? Uh, and we were also concerned of the consequences of this thing flying up and, and uh, blocking the main pulmonary trunk. So we decided in the end that uh, stent jailing was the best option. And in order to investigate this, um, we gently inflated a balloon to see how it responded. And we were pleased to find that uh, at low pressures, it seemed to mold to the side of the IVC. So that gave us the confidence to then place a stent in and we reconstructed the IVC and uh, 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 both our iliac vessels with this rather extensive shopping list. But as, as you saw from that angiogram, she still had persisting compression of the external iliac veins. Um, now, the case had gone on for quite a long time by now, and uh, we, uh, we hadn't seen any prior evidence of uh, that uh, peripheral external iliac compression. And then we thought outside the box and realized that it was her bladder that was compressing. Uh, and once that was drained, we realized we didn't have to stent below the external iliac veins. Uh, sorry, below the inguinal ligaments. Um, so just to emphasize a point I made earlier, in the prone position, supine position, and even on CT, uh, the anatomical marker of the medial border of uh, the L5 pedicle uh, is uh, pretty consistent and um, uh, especially in Maytherna lesions, the, the lesion usually corresponds with the L5 uh, pedicle uh, or spinous process, sorry, spinous process. Um, so as I have demonstrated in the three cases presented, you don't have to uh, complete treatment in one setting, but it is our preferred technique <coughs> um, and, and we would advocate for that 
as it avoids prolonged patient um, symptomatology or suffering, uh, and we feel uh, leads to an improved outcome. Uh, and uh, just as I emphasized in the last case, veins are dynamic and they respond dramatically to hydration status and even extrinsic pressure from normal structures within the, uh, the body, including the bladder. So of course, uh, if you have IVUS or any other adjuncts at your disposal, such as a CT angio hybrid, then um, it's definitely worth using them to the patient's advantage. And lastly, in answer to the topic, um, and as the uh, cases have demonstrated, yes, venous stenting uh, needs to be uh, deployed during thrombolysis, but it's imperative that most residual clot is removed before definitively treating the underlying lesion with this uh, balloon and or stent because uh, uh, the lesion is protective during thrombolysis to a degree and alleviates the need for IVC filter placement. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. There's some great cases there. Did you ever work out what that uh, calcific lesion within the IVC was? Um, so I believe it was biopsied um, and uh, didn't come back uh, with anything sinister. It was just a sequelae of whatever insult she had to the uh, kidney, which ended up um, calcifying that vessel and, and protruding thrombus uh, into the IVC, which then calcified. Oh, wow. Steve, have you seen something like that before? Uh, occasionally you do see calcified thrombus. It's, it's very uncommon, but uh, you know, you do see it and that's a great result, Jonathan. Those pictures look lovely at the end. And I think, uh, you know, increasingly, I, th I think either the, the Venovo 20 or the, um, or Abre 20s are pretty good stents to use in the IVC. I mean, we're starting to move towards those for sure. You know, they, they do quite well. So um, I think that was a was a really well handled case, uh, and particularly the emptying the bladder at the end bit. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it just goes to show that um, hmm. you do have to sometimes think outside the box. But uh, certainly, uh, it was a lot more complex than I glossed over in my presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're always tricky. That's a it's a great result. Well done. Thank you. Just before we uh, move on to you, you Steve. Uh, we had another question about um, the, the uh, oh, where was it? It was about the configuration of iliac stenting and IVC stenting. I'm going to leave that till next week because we've got a whole session related to ILEO cable stenting configuration and things. So uh, I'm purposely not going to answer that question. We'll leave it to next week. So we'll have to leave it there. But let's move on to our next speaker who has been extremely helpful tonight. It's uh, Dr. Stephen Black in the UK. Stephen is uh, one of the world uh, leading vascular surgeons for vascular pathology and treatments. He's uh, well known from everywhere. He uh, works at, uh, with a couple of other people of, who I know over at St. George's and St. Thomas's in, in, in London. And Stephen, I come to rely on with uh, his opinions quite often these days because there's a lot of stuff that he sees that we in Australia just don't touch on. So I'm sure that we're going to find his uh, talk extremely important. And I've actually got him talking about something that we just brought up briefly um, today, and that's stents in, and pregnancy. Because these are questions that uh, we have lots of young women who have got uh, May Therners or have had ileofemoral DBTs treated. And it's a common question which is asked and something that I think here in Australia, we just don't have enough experience on. So I'm gonna ask Stephen uh, to give us a few answers regarding this. I'll hand it over to you, Steve. I'll hand it back first. Right. And there we go. Let's see how we go here. Right, there we go. So uh, uh, thanks Steve for that uh, kind introduction and you know I, I have a I have a particularly soft spot for Australia nowadays uh, my only disappointment is not being able to visit um, at these times that we are, are currently in but uh, I keep having to reflect on on lists like these of uh, what am I doing in, in London you know? so uh, 
to all of my friends in Australia, it's great to be here uh, to uh, to join this uh, very informative chat, and there's been great, uh, really interesting presentation so far today. So you know, pregnancy, as Steve alluded to, is one of these things that freaks us all out. So we get really concerned about patients going to become pregnant. We get really concerned managing patients who are pregnant. And it increases not only the complexity of the cases, but also anxiety. And I think that anxiety on both the side of the patient and the side of the treating physician is one of the things that makes this, this so difficult for us to, to get through. And because very few people have done any of it, because we're all averse to it, the, the risks are not specifically known and the evidence base is, is not particularly big. So a, a lot of this becomes kind of pragmatic and figuring it out as you, as, as you go along. So we don't really know what the rate of major bleeding in pregnant patients that undergo thrombolysis is because you know, young, fit, healthy people don't tend to get strokes or cardiovascular complications or uh, you know, DVT has typically not been treated over the years. But there isn't any evidence to suggest that bleeding risk should be higher when you compare this to patients who, don't have, uh, who are not pregnant. Uh, and uh, the total amount of treatment you give, particularly if you use some of the more modern methods, should be relatively low, and the thrombolytic agents should not cross the placenta during treatment. So there shouldn't be, in theory, a risk to the fetus. But these are obviously things that we've got to kind of take on, on face value, and uh, it's all part of the counseling process when you speak to patients who might need treatment. Uh, the biggest concern is, of course, radiation in pregnancy. Uh, and if you're going to treat somebody, the fetus is most susceptible in the first trimester, which is the first three, three to 16 weeks, uh, and is really dependent on the dose. So if you can keep the dosing very small with uh, low doses of hopefully under half a rad, uh, it's well tolerated at all levels. So what we kind of think about when we're treating patients who might be last of pregnancy is using IVUS to do a lot of the treatment, just screen a wire in place with the protection you want to do, and then try and particularly limit contrast runs so you're not doing them. Uh, the major malformations come over 50 rads, and that's really uh, uh, birth defects, cancers, and neurological defects because the nerves are most susceptible to radiation in the developing fetus. So um, a number of women who've had a DVT, in my experience, once I've talked through this potential risk to the baby and the risk of PTS that they may have if we leave it alone, elect not to have treatment during pregnancy and see how they go. And my experience is those patients actually do quite well. You know, once they deliver, they're okay, and we have got options to treat them later down the line if we need to. So my, my kind of uh, threshold for, for kind of pushing people towards intervention and pregnancy is much lower because of these unknowns and because you know it's not only the initial uh, radiation dose you've got to consider it's also the the potential for re-intervention that you're introducing if you end up having to stent the patient and then have to go back again and do something else and radiation damage is of course uh, cumulative contrast is uh, iodinated contrast should be used uh, and they're not known to be ter ter teratogenic um, however, trying to avoid contrast is, is the best option. And this, again, is where IVUS comes in. And we've done a few procedures. I've certainly done a number of cases with IVUS where I've not used any contrast at all in patients with contrast allergies or so on. And you can perfectly reasonably treat a whole patient start to finish with IVUS and no contrast. And that takes out your inclination to doing runs, which is where most of the radiation comes from. It's, uh, for, in you know, my experience, contrast runs are typically when you don't know what to do next. So the best thing to do is do a run, give some contrast while you're thinking about your next step. And if you remove that temptation, then uh, IVUS is not harmful. You can do that as much as you like uh, while you're thinking and it won't, chase, won't change anything. So really this is the uh, acronym. This comes from Jerry O'Sullivan. As low as reasonably achievable is what you're trying to do. So all those aspects for radiation, get them down. Collimate the beam dose spread, look at your geometry, try to keep the last image, avoid mag, use the imaging uh, modalities that help you and so on and so forth. These are all standard things that we know, but if you put this all together and you have to treat a patient when they're pregnant, you can still do it and it's not totally ludicrous to offer somebody intervention during pregnancy. So we had a, a case locally in the UK where a patient was turned down because she was pregnant who ended up losing her leg from phlegmasia. And it's, you know, that's 
that's kind of uh, counterintuitive thinking. If your, li if your limb is threatened, then intervention is perfectly achievable. And in fact, you, you can still go old school and do a surgical operation. That's totally safe. So if, if you're already worried in your institution about using uh, contrast or radiation, just do a thrombectomy in a patient who's got a threatened limb. Pregnancy is not a reason not to treat. Um, there's some papers around the world. This is the Jobs Institute, which is Anthony Comoroto is, of course, uh, instrumental in the ATRAC study. And they treated 13 patients, and most of them in the third trimester, which is where you will see the majority of DVTs occurring. Uh, and they safely thrombolized and removed the clot in all three of these patients without any significant complications. Again, quite clearly small numbers. If we looked at our group of patients where we have intervened in, in that sort of peripartum period, um, uh, they did quite a lot worse than our uh, comparative group of females. So we had uh, only seven, so not big numbers either, but uh, we had 72 women uh, over a similar time period who went, who went through thrombolysis who were not pregnant. Uh, and both the reintervention rates and the lytic were higher. So my, my first assumption with this was that we were uh, dealing with a pro-thrombotic condition in pregnancy. But actually, when we went back and looked at each of the individual cases, the main problem was we bottled it on treating some of these patients in our early experience. So the combination of our anxiety about the pregnant patient and the patient's anxiety around pregnancy, and some of these had just delivered babies, uh, meant that we didn't treat them in the same way that we treated the other woman. It was mostly technical reasons in incomplete clot clearance, failure to stent adequately, failure to comp continue lysis as long as possible, uh, that resulted in failure, not anything to do with uh, 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 increased um, prothrombotic tendencies in, in, in pregnancy. And actually, there's a big study that's come out recently which has demonstrated that the risk of DVT in pregnancy is not related to increased uh, being prothrombotic in pregnancy. That's always what we thought, but that's not the reason for it. So it's often a structural reason and probably related to flow changes from the gravid uterus that are causing increased risk, which of course we can, we can look at mitigating against. What about pregnancy after stenting? So the common question in the young patients is, what happens if I have a stent and then want to have a family, I want to have children? Uh, so there's three papers that really have looked at this. Uh, Neil Speckard has published a lot. Uh, Olivia Hartung has published the biggest series looking at patients who had pregnancy. Uh, after a stent and uh, this mo more recent paper that came from, from the US. And between these three groups, they've got 107 patients. So there's not a huge experience worldwide of people who've had stents and become pregnant. We've got, um, I've got 15 women now who've had stents and gone on to have children. Uh, and we've had one patient in our experience from both a stent during her pregnancy, which occurred in the second trimester. Um, and we didn't get informed about it, so we only found out that it had blocked uh, when she delivered the baby. Uh, and it, you know, we could work it out from when she started getting symptoms again. In this series of three patients, very few have had any complications during pregnancy. And in fact, in the Beckard paper, one woman had four children after a stent with no complications to it. So pregnancy does not mean you're going to have problems with your stent. You can perfectly safely go on to have a family. It's not a reason not to have a family. It's certainly not a reason not to stent in somebody who may want to, to go on and have children. The issue you have to think about is, um, is um, having a very clear anticoagulation discussion with them about what they will need to do in their pregnancy. And what we do in patients who had uh, pregnancies, so we will then start anticoagulation in the third trimester. If they've got increased risk factors, we might give them anticoagulation throughout. And if they're on anticoagulation, we'll give it to them throughout. Uh, and then you have to have a very clear strategy of anticoagulation around the delivery to make sure that you minimize interruption of anticoagulation in that peripartum period. So for somebody who may be antiphospholipid syndrome positive, for example, we will then advise that woman that she should not have an epidural and should have uh, either a normal delivery without a epidural or a GA cesarean section so that you don't interrupt anticoagulation in the peripartum. Um, and so it's just about having those conversations with your hematologist and having very clear plans around it. Uh, but um, uh, you can absolutely go on and have, a, have, a, have a, a normal pregnancy after having a stent. The other caveat I do have is when I talk to patients who have got symptoms who actively trying to fall pregnant, 
I might say to them, let's delay the treatment till after your pregnancy. Because again, it's at risk of reintervention in complex patients. If somebody's trying to fall pregnant, you have a stent, then they fall pregnant, then they get a complication, and you're trying to manage all of that, that's an issue. So I try to say, look, let, if we're going to stent you now, let's wait six months, make sure everything's good, and then go on and, and fall pregnant, or have your baby first, and then we come back and treat you afterwards. So you know, different people feel differently. It depends on how bad their symptoms are. But you know, I had this conversation with a patient in clinic just yesterday with her and her husband, and they've decided to, to try and have a baby first and see how that goes. And you, know, you can always come back and deal with a stent. I think the, the main issue there is if there's any really big risk, we know that block stents are a total nightmare. You know, we, I, 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 no, none of us have a good solution to a chronically occluded stent yet that I'm aware of, you know, apart from big open bypass surgery and, and not many of us are up for that. So it's having a very practical, sensible conversation with the patients normally you get to the right decision um but uh yeah there we go those are my thoughts no thanks steve they're, they're very good thoughts because it's things that we deal with every single day and i think what you've brought up is extremely important you need to have a an approach with everyone involved and that that's really important to have your hematologist involved. And, and Scott, you know for sure that um, being involved in these patients who have had stents or have had clots in the past, you're asked questions about appropriate anticoagulation therapy and whether it's safe for their, their pregnancy and what do we do during that. So an approach with your, your obstetric gyne obstetrician, your hematologist, your vascular surgeon, you just need that combined approach. One question I had for um, Scott was that pregnancy, when we were taught through um, med school, was actually anti-thrombotic. Is that actually the case or? Oh, Scott? Sorry. Um, oh, he's back. Yeah, no, I was interested in um, Stephen's uh, comments about the growth of we might, we might turn your video off, the, Scott. Um, yep. The anatomical. Yep. You got me now? We got you now. Yeah. Okay. Now, I was just saying, I was very interested in Stephen's comments about the prothrombotic uh, coagulopathy or, or, mm. or, or state that occurs versus the uh, anatomical risk factor. So I think that's, you know, really important to hear, particularly as a, a, as a hematologist. Um, but but I think you know that whole uh, uh, condition, whatever it's from, uh, is very much a, a real one. Um, and therefore, moving forward, you know, for, for future pregnancies and future risks, or during the the, the time of risk, we we need to uh, mitigate against that with you know active uh, anticoagulation. And and Stephen's tips there about the very high risk patient uh, and how to work out uh, uh, safe delivery from a thrombotic and a bleeding point of view uh, are also very important, I think. Um, because you know, usually we've got patients that can tolerate a lack of anticoagulation for a, uh, 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 either a, a natural delivery or an induction of delivery where you're stopping anticoagulation for a period of time before the uh, um, pregnancy occurs and you can really uh, institute uh, full anticoagulation safely. Absolutely. Steve, I mean, postpartum, um, I mean, you get that, that woman who turns up with a big highly ephemeral DVT. Mm. In these situations, um, are you still think lysis is a safe way to go or should be open thrombectomy? What's your thoughts on that? Well, we do do lysis, but I think we've got so many options now to minimize the dose of total yeah. dose of TPA you give. So if you use, uh, that's where we kind of the uh, Angerjet first strategy of, of aspiration plus uh, Lytic work. I think actually we've got some newer devices that are coming out and VTEX is a device I've used now a few times. We did a first in man study of that. You don't use any Lytic. It's a little bit similar to Inari, which some of you might be aware of from the States. And again, Penumbra, I think, has a role in these patients where you're not using any lytic at all. You debulk all the clot and then maybe use a, a little bit of intraoperative lytic to clean things up 
balloon it and 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 then and then do your stenting and be uh, you know minimizing that risk a bit of how you'd approach a patient i had a patient who had a a big uh, retroperitoneal hematoma from uh, coronary angioplasty who then got a big ilefemoral DVT and his leg was threatened and we treated him with um, with you know, sort of a really minimal lytic uh, approach with aspiration and so on and that was that was fine so it's that balance of the bleeding risk versus the clearing the clot and trying to get them treated I think what we learned from our early approach to these patients was we, we, you have to commit to the procedure and the intervention. If you're gonna do it, do it, and do it properly and take the patient through that. The, the, the issues are managing the baby. You've got a mother in hospital who's anxious. She doesn't have a baby with her. The baby's at home. You're keeping them away from their family. So you get all these additional issues that cope with it, which is why, like everything else, it's a team event. So we have hematologists, we have obstetricians, we have the, uh, uh, you know, the nursing care team who the postpartum nurses involved, you have to get all those people on board to kind of manage that anxiety that is generated for everyone by treating a pregnant uh, patient. And, you know, if it goes wrong, we're going to make the baby an orphan, all those sort of things that come into it and, uh, you know, yeah, but, but commit or, or manage them conservatively. So you can't, you can't kind of half ass it. Totally. And the other um, thing is that, sorry, go Scott. Well, yeah, and I was just going to ask you, Steve, this is coming back to your original comment about fibrinogen or monitoring uh, something that's worrying you about bleeding risk. I mean, yeah. given that you're getting a little bit of systemic escape and therefore systemic risk of bleeding in the uh, situation that Steve described, uh -huh. uh, I mean, do, do you have any tips in that regard? Do you... Uh, uh, you know, go for your catheter-directed or your, uh, your local thrombolytic therapy. Uh, but if you're getting a reduction, severe reduction in fibrinogen, just giving them fibrinogen concentrates and yes, to try to reduce the bleeding. Yeah, yeah. So we, we basically do that. So you know, what we'll do with people at particularly high risk, like the peripartum patients, is be more aggressive in measuring things like fibrinogen and other levels and replacing that. So. We, we would actively replace those patients with fibrinogen concentrates, and we have a protocol for that, that if it drops below a certain level, we'll keep it up, particularly if they're going to then, you know, have problems with um, the, the, the bleeding that would be related to the, to the, to the, the uterine placenta being delivered and, and so on. So um, I think this is where the subtlety of management comes into it. Uh, you've got your standard patient that you just, Put, put aside and you crack on and you do it and you try to monitor as little as possible because that's a problematic. But the higher risk groups, you increase the level of, of input you have from the whole team. So uh, you probably know of Beverly Hunt, but she's all over this and we've got you know protocols that have been developed for every single one of those stages and we have a, a measuring strategy for fibrinogen and if it drops below a certain level, they get uh, uh, fibrinogen replacement and you know to, to, to keep on top of that so the, you know this is why it's a team event isn't it and that's why people like like you in hospitals have to be involved in in managing that because you know most of us vascular surgeons particularly South African vascular surgeons we're a bit thick and we don't understand all of this stuff you know I don't think you're doing too bad Steve <laughs> um all right, so let's just take away that um, the stents in, and women getting pregnant aren't really an issue. We just have to watch the um, second and third trimesters. Uh, just to wrap up, we've got just a couple of questions to go through. Back to the um, one of the previous talks, uh, there was a question about, should we lyse the entire lesion to restore flow but leave the cap? Um, and they're worried about preventing an embolus. Anyone want to answer that question for us? Um, I'd say I, I was going to type an answer there, but I, I think basically leaving that cap to the end and that leaving that cap to the end is not only about embolus, it's also about all the mechanical devices cause a degree of hemolysis and it's much worse than flowing blood. So if you're leaving that cap to the end and you do that last bit at the end, then you reduce the rate of renal impairment from um, uh, hemoglobin urea afterwards. So you're limiting that, that reduction. And that also comes with a fluid management strategy. So one of the things for AngioJet is make sure you hydrate your patients. You know, you want that forced diuresis to come with all of the lytic effects. But if you measure the renal function of these patients with acute DVT, they all have a pre-existing ACHI practically in every single patient from that clot burden that is putting the strain in the kidneys. So, you know, give them fluid, 
leave the cap to the end is not about embolism so much as, as stopping all that hemoglobin urea stuff that, that, that comes with lithium. It can be quite problematic. You get quite a yeah. lot of um, renal dysfunction following that. So you've got to be very careful. The other question uh, was uh, from about an IVDU, uh, suppurative ileofemoral DVT. If you've got something with um, uh, gas within the clot all the way to the confluence, what's your approach, uh, Stephen? I think this is directed to you. What's your mm. approach to a suppurative ileofemoral DVT? Yeah. Uh, so we, um, you know, with Waterloo Station just around the corner from us, we get quite a lot of RVD use who, who come in and get managed. And in the acute phase, if they got infection and stuff like that, I'd sit tight and, and not do anything on them because those sort of patients, generally speaking, are going to be very poorly compliant with anything you do. They're at a high risk of bleeding complications afterwards. They're not going to take the anticoagulation. So I manage them, uh, you know, with antibiotics and, and kind of medical management as, as a front line. And I would only really do any intervention if there was uh, a significant risk of limb loss to that patient uh, and you then managing it, it you know similarly to how you do when you get those groins falling apart from needle injuries into the common femoral artery and so on you tie everything off and you you know you kind of cross your fingers um, managing them later down the line is quite hard as well because it's not the same process of thrombosis normally they've generally speaking destroyed the vein scarred it up and then you don't have something that you can reconstruct or recreate so um it, you know it, it can be quite labor intensive but if there's gas and infection and so on around you really don't want to be putting stents in or anything else uh, you know uh, during that initial in intervention so you know antibiotics cross your fingers hope for the best they'll be leaving your hospital anyway in about a day to go and get their drugs so you don't really have to worry about it for too long Great. Well, look, I think we're going to wrap up there. Um, it's been an extremely good discussion with um, our panelists today. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking part, Stephen, and, and thank you for interrupting your clinic. Jonathan, again, thank you for your talks. Chris and Scott, thank you for your excellent talks and discussions today. Um, I'll lead on with, I'm just going to take the screen one more time um, to show the next session. Oh. So in our next session, which is planned to be on the 30th of September, again, the same time, we've got Eman Bayat, we've got Patrick Tosanovsky, Rick de Graff, and Patrice um, Papuati, all talking on several different topics. So I think one of the questions was uh, aliofemoral uh, venous and aliocable uh, venous construction with stents. They're all going to be answered in your next session. So please join us on the 30th of September. And once again, I'd like to thank everyone involved, BD and Phillips, and especially our presenters, all for putting in such a, a good effort and helping educate us tonight on uh, such an interesting topic. So I'm gonna wrap up there and say good night to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.